nation by the Spirit of God. Deliverance by the Spirit of God. Healing by the Spirit of God. It's only by the Spirit of God. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Okay, uh, this is part two of uh, We Wrestle Not with Flesh and Blood, but with Principalities and Powers of Darkness in Heavenly Places. And I thought that I could do this in two weeks, but I can't. So it'll probably be another two after this, just to conclude this whole concept of what it is to wrestle with principalities and powers of darkness. Um, many people don't understand this. Many Christians don't understand the spiritual battle that we are in. You know it and I know it. The, the, the biggest problems in our life began when we got born again because we were translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear son. Now we're a threat to the devil. And he doesn't like that. So we, we need to appreciate this battle that we're living in. And I want to just quickly recap on, on some thoughts from, from last week. This, this, um, we went right back. If you want to understand the kingdom, you've got to go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. The creation. And we looked, we looked at... Um, the scripture that says, God commanded the man to say, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. There is the beginning of mankind's problems. They disobeyed God. Okay? I don't think I need to dwell on that. You, you get that, okay? The problem started when Adam disobeyed God. God and he fell from grace and the Bible says that in that day you shall surely die we know that Adam did not die physically but he died spiritually in his relationship with God he, God came looking for him God still loved him etc etc but something had happened to Adam that, that caused him to hide from God and uh, the, the problem started when the serpent said to the woman in Genesis 3, 4, you will not surely die. So here you've got God on the one hand saying, if you eat it, you're going to die. And you've got the devil over here saying, no, you won't die. Does that sound familiar? Do you get a little voice in your head telling you, you're okay, you're okay. Because this is how the devil works. He doesn't... He doesn't make a big announcement, he whispers in our ears. He subtly opposes the word of God. And that's exactly what Adam did. It brought destruction on the human race. And in Romans 8, 12 to 13, Paul wrote, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, 
you will die. You won't die physically, but you will die spiritually if you walk according to the flesh. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And here is the difficulty of our walk with God. Putting to death the deeds of the body and the mind. That, that's this where the, the battle lies. We, we are the new creation in Christ. We are wrestling with the old man in Adam. And that doesn't happen overnight. Dying to self is a lifelong process. But we must go, if we want to go from faith to faith, from glory to glory, we must die to ourselves and to live for Jesus Christ. In uh, this, this passage in 1 John, we saw that what happened in the garden was the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And John emphasizes this in his first epistle. He says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Can you see this whole understanding of when God says something, you do it. And regardless of the fact that the devil might tell you something else, you do what God tells you. This is where the big problems arise in our lives, where we have this wrestle, where the flesh wants to go this way, but the spirit wants to go that way. And Paul, Paul recognizes this in, in the seventh chapter of Romans, where, where he says, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, those things I do. Wretched man that I am. Anybody identify with that? You want to go God's way, but you find the flesh and the carnal mind is pulling us this way. And pulling us this way is, is fueled by the devil. Go on, it's okay. God understands. That's all right. Just this once. That's how he, he talks to you. He whispers in our ears and we're not smart enough to recognize when the devil is talking to us. This is why we need the word of God. And so these, these three things are in the world. We're in the world, but we're not of it. And so we've got to rise above the lust of the flesh, the, the pride of life, the lust of the eyes. And... Um, this, this passage in 2 Corinthians, this is my, my launching verse for today. Paul, Paul is writing um, because he's, you know, he's trying to get the, the churches in Asia Minor to, to turn towards Jesus Christ. And he, he writes, but if anyone has caused grief, he has not grieved me, but all of you to some extent, not to be too severe. This punishment, which was inflicted by the majority, is sufficient for a man, so that, on the contrary, you ought to rather forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. Therefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. For to this end I also wrote that I might put you to the test whether you are obedient in all things. Now, whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. For if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ. Now listen to this. Lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. We are not ignorant of his devices, or are we? How does the devil work against us? Are you aware that even as we sit here, listening to the word of God, the enemy is trying to distract us? He's trying to take us off the word of God and onto the things of the world. You know it and I know it. You can be sitting here and you can be even in the middle of worship and a, a little thought comes into your head and suddenly your mind goes off somewhere else. Yes? Yes? Come on, this is just being honest. And this is how the devil works against us. He gets into our head. What's that, Dolores? 
So we, we, the Bible tells us we're not ignorant of his devices. We need to know how the devil works. You know, um, last week was just setting up the principle for the two kingdoms that, that are at war with one another, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness. We are in the middle of this battle. And unfortunately, our bodies, our carnal mind, want to live in this world, but our spirit desperately wants to live in this world and obey Jesus Christ. And it's a battle. It's a battle that we all experience. And we have to overcome the temptations that come against us, the the forces that pull us or try to pull us away from God. We have to acknowledge it. We're not ignorant of his devices. We should be aware of how the devil lies to us. He whispers in our ear and he tries to pull us away from God. How many of you believe that you are a real problem for the devil? You know, we think the devil's a real problem for us. No, we're a real problem for the devil. He doesn't like us. He doesn't like the fact that we bear the name of Jesus Christ. And we we have the power and the authority of his shed blood and the power of the Holy Spirit working through us. You know, the the devil has fooled us into thinking that he's some terrible, evil power that will just overwhelm us. Yes, he is a, a terrible, evil power, but he does not overwhelm us if we know who we are in Jesus Christ. We must know, because I'm telling you right now, times are coming, I don't know how far away, but when there's going to be manifestations of demonic power. It's going to happen. In the way. I think we can see a lot of it, even today. We can see how lies, deception, they're all prevalent, and we'd rather be comfortable and follow a lie than, than, than fight against that lie and follow the truth. In, in 2 John 1, 7, John writes, Many deceivers have gone out in the world who do not confess Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. You know, we think of the antichrist. There are many antichrists. Yes, there is the antichrist, but there are also many antichrists that come preaching a gospel that will take you away from Jesus Christ. Paul Paul constantly warns his, his readers. He constantly warns about listening to the wolves in sheep's clothing. This is why I encourage you not just to listen to me. You find out for yourselves. You know, I expect you to take note of these scriptures and find out, am I, am I presenting it accurately? You need to know for yourselves. In John 8, 44 to 47, he's talking to the Pharisees. He says, you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Do you you realize the devil cannot tell a truth? Even if he tells you something that is true, it's to deceive you. There's no truth in him whatsoever. Do you understand what I'm saying there? You know, when he said to Jesus, um, you know, it's written. He was telling the truth. It's written. But he was trying to tempt Jesus into the pride of life. Lust of the eyes. Lust of the flesh. That was his desire. He was telling the truth to Jesus. It is written. And Jesus knew his word. But it's also written. This is why we have to know the word of God. This is why we've got so many different doctrines in the church today. Because people would follow a particular doctrine rather than read the Bible for themselves and piece it all together and realize who we are in Jesus Christ. People ask me, are you a Calvinist, an Arminian, Catholic, Protestant? I said, no, none of the above. Oh, Seventh-day Adventist, Jehovah's Witness. And the list, I said, no, no, none of the above. I said, what are you then? I said, I'm a child of the living God. I belong to the church of Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm part of the body of Jesus Christ. That's who we have to see ourselves as. We're not Pentecostals. We're not this, that, or the other. We're children of the living God, and we should be feeding on his word. So he says there's no truth in the devil. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. For he is a liar and the father of it. The devil is going to come whispering in your ear. He won't tell you any truth. So you need to be, you need to be able to discern that little voice 
It comes into your head. That's why the Bible says so much about the mind, casting down all vain imaginations and every high thought that exalts itself above knowledge of Jesus Christ. Bring your mind into captivity. Set your mind on the things above. Let this mind be in you that was also in Jesus Christ. The Bible says so much about the mind because it's where, where we formulate what we're going to do and what we're going to think. Somebody once said, if you think about something long enough, you'll do it. You'll do it. So, so you've got to be careful about what you're thinking. And in verse 45... He says, but because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. Remember when Pilate was confronted with with Jesus' comment, you know? And uh, he, tells, he tells Pilate who, who he is virtually. And Pilate says, oh, what is truth? What is truth? And, and so we want our own truth. Our own truth is inadequate. We will do what's right in our own eyes if we just want our truth, what suits me. We need the word of God. I, I think the, whatever happens in these last days, the, the body of Jesus Christ has got to get back to the word of God. This is our roadmap to heaven. And he says, he who is of God hears God's word. And he says to the, you do not hear because you're not of God. But it's very important. You know, I, I'm aware of this. When, when I share these messages, I'm aware that you've heard, you know these scriptures, you, you know. But somebody once said, repetition is the best teacher. We need to keep hearing. You keep hearing the world, the world all the time. You remember that song by Skyhooks? Horror movies right there on your TV? And he was talking about the 6.30 news. Because given, they give us nothing but disaster. They give us nothing but the bad news. Well, we're preaching the good news. This passage in Hosea, which I think most of you would know, was the passage of scripture that God spoke to me when I was just a young Christian. And he said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And and, and if that wasn't bad enough, he goes on, he said, because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being a priest for me. I I think that is tragic, because you've rejected knowledge knowledge. You know, the Bible, the scriptures have got everything in it that pertains to godliness and life. Everything. But how, how much attention do we give the word of God? Now, just, just to, to re-emphasize this idea of the two kingdoms, Paul says in Romans 6.16, 6, do you not know that to whom you present yourself slave to obey, you are that one slave who you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. Can you see how this works in the Garden of Eden? Sin led to death. All he had to do was obey one commandment. God gave him everything except this one thing. There's just one thing. Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day that you eat it, you will surely die. And so we have a choice to make. Are we going to follow the truth? Or are we going to follow the word? The world, sorry, the world. The word, the world. The difference is L. With an H-E-L-L. I just thought of that. That's quite good. (laughs) Okay. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, now what, where does this one fit in? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The reason why I think this is important to understand is because we have to live a life of repentance. A, a lot of people believe that once you're born again, 
all your sins, past, present, and future, they're all forgiven. Well, they're only forgiven if you ask forgiveness. God does not automatically forgive us our sins because we are in Christ. If we're in Christ, we have to live according to his kingdom. Otherwise, he will vomit us out. He will cut us off. There's a lot of terms for it. So we, one of the things that we need to learn to do more than anything else as Christians, as children of the living God, is to confess our sins. You know, I, I, I believe that um, when we do this, I do this every day, morning and evening. Absolutely will not go to bed without praying, Lord, forgive me for anything that I've done, said, or thought that has displeased you. Because sometimes we, have, we, we sin and we don't know that we've sinned. And sometimes we sin because we didn't do something that we should do. Is that a fair statement? Sometimes we have an opportunity to do something that we should do and we don't do it. That's sin. And so I ask his forgiveness for anything I've said, done, or thought that has displeased him. And I ask his forgiveness for anything that I haven't said, done, or thought that I should have done. And I'm just acknowledging to God that I'm weak. Lord, sometimes I sin and I don't realize it's the sin of ignorance, the sin of presumption. You know, the sin of presumption is a doozy. You know, you're, you're running late for a meeting and you're, you're 20K over the speed limit and you say, oh God, you know, I know I'm doing the wrong thing here, but, but uh, you know, that's the sin of presumption. So, so we need to appreciate that we need to live a daily walk of repentance. Not, not just think that because we ask God's forgiveness when we were born again and we were a new creation. I guarantee you, the moment you were born again, within a minute, you've sinned. You just, we, we sin. Walking in the Spirit and being a lover of Jesus Christ is, it doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. But I'll tell you one way to get perfect is to acknowledge your sins, acknowledge your faults and your mistakes in God. And it softens your heart. You know, if we, if, we, if we allow sin to build up in our hearts, it will put calluses on our hearts. It will harden our hearts. And we won't hear the conviction of the Holy Spirit. We become hardened to God. We'll address that in just a moment. So, live a life of repentance you know, and I'm not talking about condemning yourself. Paul tells us in Romans, there's now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus who walk according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh. Walking according to the Spirit is not getting everything right. But when you get it wrong, you ask his forgiveness and you're walking in the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit is employing everything that God has done for us. Okay, everybody get that? The, um, um, the reason I'm putting all this is because it helps us to get a better picture of the kingdom that we're living in and the battle that is going on in our lives, even today. Even as we stand and sit here today. Me being the only one standing, of course. But, <laughs> but can you see the purpose of this? If we don't understand the kingdom, we will live carelessly. A passage of scripture in Hebrews chapter 2, 1 to, 1 to 3, where it says, uh, Therefore give them more earnest heed to the things you've heard, lest you drift away. We, we need to live for God. We need to live for Jesus Christ. We need to die daily. You know, if, if Paul, when he had his conversion, if that was it, if that was his guarantee of heaven, why does it say that he has to die daily? He said, I die daily. It's a battle of things I want to do, I don't do. Things I don't want to do, those things I do. Wretched man that I am. He understood the battle. If he was here preaching to you today, he said, I understand, guys. It's a battle. It's a war. And it's a tough. And the devil doesn't play according to the rules. And he plays dirty. And we need to understand that. 
So we need to be constantly cleansed and we need to be constantly praying to God, setting our mind on the things above. We need to constantly be reading the Word of God. Remember the first message of this year? The three things that we need to say, I'm going to improve in the reading of the Word of God, prayer, and renewing the mind. I tell you, if we, if we, if we fix our mind on those three things for this year, coming year, I'll tell you right now, next Christmas we'll be different people. We'll be different people. You cannot commit to the Word of God. You cannot commit to praying. You cannot commit to renewing your mind and stay where you are. So take, take, it, take it from the Scriptures. Don't just listen to me. 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 9. Paul here describes what it's going to be like and what I believe are the end times, the last days. We, well, I think we're in, we've got to realize the signs are all there. Signs are all there. And Paul writes this, he says, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Now, now listen to this description and tell me whether you can identify with it. He, he says, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, Proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And listen to this, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. That's called self-righteousness. We can only be the opposite to those things if we have the power of the Holy Spirit living within us, if we yield to the Holy Spirit. Now, if you were to have a look at all those attributes there and say to yourself, okay, well, these are the things that the world are emphasizing. So I've got to be the opposite. If I want to be Christ-like, I've got to love others, not love money. You know, money is not evil. It's the love of money that is the root of all evil. So money in itself is not evil. It's how we use it. But don't love it. Don't love it. Are we a boaster or are we humble? Are we proud or humble? Are we blasphemers? Are we holy? All these things that Paul says, this is what it's going to be like in the, in the end times. All those things, we have to be the opposite. So, you know, I, I, I could preach for a few weeks on these elements, but it's up to you. You've got to look at these things. And, are you a despiser of good? Oh, of course not. But do you pursue righteousness? You know, we've got to look at passages of Scripture like this. In, 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 in verse 5, when it says, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And from such people turn away. For this sort are those who creep into households, make captives of gullible women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never coming to the knowledge of the truth. Don't you think that's tragic? Forever learning, but never coming to the knowledge of the truth. And I want to tell you right now, there are Christians all over this planet who are learning, 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 but never coming to the knowledge of the truth. Who is the truth? Jesus Christ. They have a form of godliness, like the Pharisees. They had had their robes of righteousness. And, And so we need to appreciate we need to appreciate that it's not just being a reader of the word, you've got to be a doer of the word. Jesus said to the Pharisees, do what they say, but don't do what they do. That's where we get the term hypocrite from. We don't want to be hypocrites. We, if we're going to be children of the living God, we've got to live like children of the living God, and we've got to examine ourselves, test ourselves, prove ourselves. Do we not know ourselves as to whether we're actually in the faith? I don't want to be one of those that have a form of godliness but deny the power. Where, where does the godliness come from? It's got to come from the Holy Spirit, not from my own resources. 
So in verse 8, he says, Janes and Jambres resisted Moses. So do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds disapproved concerning the faith. But they will progress no further, for their folly will be manifest to all, as theirs was also. In James, now listen to this, listen to this. Who is wise and understanding among you? Now, how many here would like to consider themselves wise and understanding? Of course you would. Of course you would. But whether we are or not is another matter. Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy, these are, again, works of the flesh that we have to wrestle with and we have to pull down and we have to replace them with the fruit of the Spirit. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. This, this is where we're going with this particular message, to, t- to understand the difference between earthly sin, sensual sin, and demonic sin. He says it very clear, for where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, peaceable, gentle, willing to yield full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now, the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Now, there's a reason why I'm giving you all these scriptures, so that, you know, I'm I'm assuming that you're going to study this and not just take my word for it. I'm assuming you'll get into your word and say, yeah, I I need to see how these all, uh, you know, line up, how they all work together. Because I want to be a child of the living God. I want to be a servant of Jesus Christ. I want to be a good ambassador. Now, if we don't want that, you're going to have to go to another church, which many have. Many have. We we don't want to hear, come on, you need to die to yourself. You need to consider others more highly than yourself. You need to be humble. You know that passage, we all know the passage in Second Chronicles 7.14, I think it is. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. He's talking about the children of God. Then he will come, heal the land, restore things. So just... Please make a note of that. They're first earthly, natural. You know, anger is not a sin. The Bible doesn't say, don't get angry. But in anger, there is sin. So you, you, you would be justified if somebody pushed a little old lady over and you, you'd get angry. That's, that's earthly. That's natural. That's natural. But if you started to let the anger get the better of you and then it gets into your soul... You know, which, which would be the sensual area, you start, it starts to get the better of you. Yes, you know what it's like where you've lost control and you, it's got the better of you. So you've, you've let it get into the sensual area. Now, if you don't deal with that, if you don't deal with that and you're, you're prone to angry outbursts or whatever, I'm telling you right now, it becomes a demonic problem. You're giving food for the enemy. And then it becomes rage. So these these are things that we need to recognize and guard ourselves against. And he he says, what he says at the end there, and he says, now the fruit of righteousness is sown by peace by those who make peace. And Jesus said on the Mount uh, of Olives, not the Mount of Olives, the Sermon on the Mount, he said, blessed are the peacemakers. Are you a peacemaker? Are you somebody that will come between two people having an argument and try to pour a little bit of water on it or do you pour oil on it? You know, there's a lot, there's a lot in the scriptures about how we deal with other people and what we do, how we behave as Christians. You know, in Peter, uh, 
Paul in Timothy, he says, avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. If you get, if you get into a, um, and we look at this next week, if you get into a foolish and ignorant dispute, you have just been taken captive by the devil to do his will. That's how the devil works. You, you know what it's like. When you have an argument with somebody, you, all you're interested in is showing that you're right. Yeah? Or is it just me? <laughs> Come on, you know it. If you get yourself drawn into an argument, you want to have the last say. Yes? That's the last I'm saying about this, except... <laughs> and then you just got to tag a little bit on the end. You, you've just been taken captive by the devil to do his will. The fruit of the Spirit is gentle, is peaceable, willing to yield. I would rather lose an argument and keep a friend than win an argument and lose a friend. Winning an argument shouldn't be an issue. You shouldn't be in the argument in the first place. You, you understand what I'm saying, yes? Yeah. And in and, and Hebrews... The writer says, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. You know what I was saying before? If we keep sinning and we don't repent, our heart gets harder and harder until we can't hear the conviction of the Holy Spirit. As in the day of rebellion, the day of trial in the wilderness when your fathers tested me, they tried me and saw my work for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, they always go astray in their hearts and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Beware, brethren, lest there be in you, any of you, an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. If we know the word of God that says, be peaceable, be gentle, be loving, be kind, all, all the attributes of the Holy Spirit, if we know that and we, we go against that, and we allow ourselves to get drawn into an argument or we get angry or we're thinking bad thoughts, you've just listened to the lies of the devil. I'm telling you right now, that's the work of the devil. You know, people think because they don't see demons in the, you know, floating around in, or whatever, they think they're not there. They're there all right. They're whispering to us. They whisper in our ears, go on, go on. You, you give them a piece of your mind. You're right and you need to prove that you're right. Come on. Yeah? Yeah? <laughs> Kevin's going. <laughs> but he, he warns us that we'll not enter his rest. We, we've got to bring ourselves into line with the Holy Spirit. We've got to do things his way. You know, yes, it's hard. It is really hard. But I would rather, I would rather just yield and keep my relationship with God intact. You know, I'd rather just let somebody else take the credit or let somebody else get the benefits. Doesn't matter. Does it really matter? I've got my heavenly father looking down. You know, thumbs up, like. <laughs> heavenly Facebook. <laughs> so it's a... For we, we have become partakers of Christ. Listen, this is, this is tough stuff, but it's true. He says, we have become partakers of Christ. If, that's the word that we don't like, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end, while it is said today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. So he's warning us. He's saying, just as the Israelites hardened their hearts they were showing the miracles of God for 40 years that he provided for them. Manna, supernatural water out of the rock. He provided all this. And what did they do? They complained. Complained, complained, complained. They hardened their hearts against God. And only three of them that came out of Egypt, uh, uh, you know, over the age of 20, entered the promised land. That's tragic. If that's any example of how many people are going to actually enter heaven... It's a bit scary. Many are called, but few are chosen. And we've got to make sure that we're part of those chosen few by doing it his way. And you know, I've found in my experience, when I do it his way, I find it so much more peaceful 
Even in the midst of the storm, you keep your eyes on Jesus and it doesn't seem to matter. The storm's irrelevant because you know that you're going to get to the other side. Why did the disciples worry? You know, don't, don't you care, Lord, that we're, we're sinking? And what did Jesus say? He said, I said we must go to the other side. They were going to get to the other side no matter what, but they doubted. They saw the storm and they doubted. Now, James 1, 12 to 15 is a powerful passage of scripture and we need to, we need to um, take this on board. James writes, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. God does not tempt anyone. He can't be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted. Now, please, we need to get this. Each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Who's doing the enticing? Who's doing the enticing? The devil, the enemy, is doing the entire. He knows our weaknesses. He knows our weaknesses. And if we, if we continue sinning without asking forgiveness, he's got, he's got a hook in us. And he can keep feeding us that, that bad stuff until it becomes a demonic problem. So each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived... It gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully growing, grown, brings forth death. We need to bear these things in mind. This is part of the battle that we're in. These are the instructions that God gives us to protect us through that battle and make sure we come out the other end and hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest. In John 8, 31 to 36, Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. In other words, if you don't abide in his word, you're not his disciples. If you don't take his word seriously, you're not looking to follow Jesus Christ. Tough? Yeah, it's tough. But one thing I've found, once you start to get into the word, once you discipline yourself, you can't wait to get more of it. You become addicted to the word of God. What a problem, eh? I've got this terrible addiction. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, one of the things that I believe is God's desire during this little course is for us to come into an understanding of the war that is going on in the spiritual realm. Because sometimes we think because we can't see anything, you know, Nothing's happening. I guarantee you, things are going on. Things are happening. The enemy is trying to entice. He knows our weaknesses. He will try to pull us and entice us where our weak spots are. So we have to use that to, to become strong spots. Our weaknesses need to become strengths. God can do that for us. And, and we will be allowed to go through certain stuff. How we deal with that is up to us. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants, and have never been in bondage to anyone. Uh, have they, do they know their own history? They were in bondage to the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Egyptians, and they've got the nerve to say, We've never been in bondage to anybody. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them, most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. Remember, you're slaves of the one you obey, whether of sin to death, obedience to righteousness. A slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. This should be our life's quest to know Jesus better. To get to know him better. You know, when you, when you know somebody and you're intimate with that somebody, 
you would do nothing to offend them or hurt them. You would defend them. You would, and that's why we need to get close. It's no good Jesus just being some figure that died 2,000 years ago to pay the price for my sins. No, he's the living, risen savior. He's the king of kings. You know, at Christmas time, I, I hate when we celebrate Christmas with a little baby in a manger. You know, I, I just... It's nice, yes, it's traditional, but I don't like it because I serve the risen king who reigns and rules in heaven. Uh, this little baby, was. would you like it if they celebrated your birthday that way? Come out with all these baby photographs, you know? <laughs> so James, James comes up with the answer. In James 4, 7 to 10, he says, Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Okay? So what comes first? Submit to God. If you try resisting the devil without first submitting to God, he'll eat you alive. He will eat you alive. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God. Who has to do the drawing? We draw near to God, and he will draw near to us. He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You know, when the scripture says, um, if I be lifted up, Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all to myself. He's done his work. Now we have to draw nigh to him. It's, It's like a, I don't like to put it this way, but it's like a game of chess. He's made his move. Now we have to make our move. Now he come a little bit closer. And we come a little bit closer. So we, we, we've got to realize it. It's, we have to make the first move now. Jesus started it on the cross when he said, it's finished. I've done my bit. The rest is up to you. We draw near to him. We ask his forgiveness. He forgives. We repent and we're born again. Now it's a life of obedience to Jesus Christ. Whether we like it or not, nobody is their own person. You're either in the kingdom of God or you're in the kingdom of the devil. You're for him or you're against him. There's no in-betweens. So we have to, we have to decide, who am I going to serve? Who am I going to serve? So submit to God, resist the devil, he will flee from you. When you start obeying God, when you start to do things God's way, the devil doesn't want to know you. He's not that powerful. The only power the devil has is deception. He gets in your ear. He will try to convince you of something. And if you know your word, you'll discern that's not God. A number of times people have said to me, oh, God told me this. I said, no, God didn't tell you that. That's the devil. He says, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Don't worry about what other people think. Don't worry about what other people are doing. Humble yourself before God. Acknowledge to him, God, I have a real problem with this. You know, if you have a difficulty, if you've been enticed and you, you, the devil, it's become a demonic problem whereby it's, it's an addiction. We take it to God. We don't try to beat it in the flesh. We take it to God and say, God, I've got a real problem here. You know, I remember trying to give up alcohol when I was a, a young Christian. I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. I was trying to discipline myself. And eventually, I just said, I said to God, God, I can't do this. Then I got delivered. It took, me, it took me to the point of me saying, I can't do this. And there's lots of things in our lives that we're going through that you can't fix. But we can pray, we can yield to God and trust it to him. This is the life that we Christians should be living. We should be trying to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, dying to ourselves, living for him. Humble yourselves in the sight of of the Lord, and he will lift you up. There's, uh, I've got a couple of quotes here, just interesting. I, I totally disagree with them. But this, this is the way people can see things. 
this first one here, I stop fighting my inner demons. We're on the same side now. Can you see that? I don't fight my inner demons anymore. What has he done? He's yielded to them. There's no fight anymore. And sometimes, yeah, I want to be careful here because it's not always so, but we need to learn to discern. Some, pe- some people can say to you, um, oh, I have a real peace about this. And you're saying to yourself, how can you have a peace about that? But they've just simply yielded to it and they've decided that they're going to do it no matter what. So the demon gets off their back. And they feel comfortable. And because they feel comfortable, they're not feeling this pressure anymore. They think it's God. And we need to be very careful. This is why we need to know the truth, and the truth will make us free. The word of God is truth. So if we've got the truth in us, I tell you, it's very hard for the devil to fool you. Very hard for the devil to fool you when you're full of the Holy Ghost and the word of God. This one... Somebody called Olivia, I don't, I don't know who, who that is, but it's, it's not a shame to be deceived. This is a good one. It's not a shame to be deceived, but it is to stay in deception. Remember that passage in Hosea? My people perish because of lack of knowledge, because you have rejected knowledge. If we read the word of God, the word of God will discern good and evil, right and wrong. And this, this next... This next one it speaks for itself. Now, you could put your own caption on that, couldn't you? You could say, I know what's true, but I don't want to hear it. You know, like uh, a few good men with, what's his name? You can't handle the truth. I don't want to hear it. Or you could be saying, I'm not listening to that devil. Not listening to it. The only problem is it's in the spirit realm, not the physical ears. So you can put your own caption on that one. And this, this, man's enemies are not demons, but human beings like himself. Well, it, does that come from God or from the devil himself? We wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers of darkness in heavenly places. A total contradiction to the word of God. And yet people will read that and and apply it to their lives. This is is the devil. That's that's how powerful the devil is for a born-again believer that knows his word and has a relationship with Jesus Christ. Get behind me, Satan. You're not mindful of the things of God. You know, you don't have to yell at, at spirits. You have to exercise authority. Now, next week, next week, we'll go into some practicalities as to how these demons actually work, because they are real. In, in, the, in the Western materialistic society, we don't like to think that there are actually real spiritual beings that go around influencing people. But they are. If you, if you want to believe the Bible, if you want to know what's going on in life and why you've got this battle between good and evil, you have to understand there is an enemy. But he's, that's how powerful he is. Get off my back. Get off my back. The, the hard part is to recognize it. And we're, we're going to, next week, we're gonna, I'm going to try to show you how you can recognize when a demon's at work and what sort of demon it could be. Because one thing that I've found in my experience is that the demons are very, very legalistic. If, you, if you've got a, a, a specific demon working against you, and you buy, if you cast out a demon that is not its name, it won't go. It simply won't go, because you're not talking to him. They are very, very legalistic. And therefore, we need to be able to discern. You know, discernment of spirits is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We should be able to discern what spirit is it. it at work. You know, sometimes it is just earthly, sometimes it's sensual, but sometimes you're up against the spirit of darkness and we need to know how to deal with them. 
And perhaps, I, I don't like to give any glory to the devil whatsoever, but I've got some really good testimonies, of, you know, encounters with, with demonic forces that are real. And you start to realize just how powerful the name of Jesus is. You know, I'll tell you right now, if, if most of us came up against a demon, we'd run. Because they're not pleasant. They're really not pleasant. But when you've got the blood of Jesus Christ, the, the name of Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God within you, and you, you say, Nick off. Bush, they're gone. Really, it's, it, they, they intimidate us. They fool us. They trick us. They deceive us. And we need to learn how to battle this. Not, not just for ourselves, but to help others as well to come out of the oppression of the enemy. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. Lord, we pray that you would give us greater revelation of your word, greater revelation of the kingdom, Lord, in which we live. Lord, we may be stuck here on this earth at the present, but we live in the kingdom of God. We sit in Christ at the right hand of the Father, and all authority has been given to us And we exercise that authority right now and we command you, spirits of darkness, to be bound in the name of Jesus. You will not influence our congregation. You will not influence our families. We loose our families and our congregation, our friends and so We loose them from the grips and the influences of demonic spirits right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Shall prosper